things that bring us joy. The birth of a new baby, when a wedding is finally over, (laughs) graduation, paying off your student loans, watching the Cincinnati Reds win the World Series, taking your dream vacation, eating the perfect meal, having your 38-year-old child finally move out of your house, (laughs) getting a new puppy, taking a long nap, watching the Warriors get destroyed in the NBA Finals, getting to drink your coffee while it's still warm, seeing old friends, a Paul McCartney show at Lambeau. These are things that bring us joy, and, and it feels good. Layoffs, breakups, office drama, rebellious kids, car trouble, living paycheck to paycheck and not knowing how you're going to make ends meet. These things don't. Last week we looked at what Jesus told us regarding stress. And he told us that we have to shift our mindset. And instead of being focused on the day-to-day, we have to take ourselves out of the day-to-day to the best of our ability, and we have to see the bigger picture. And this morning, we're going to see something that may be even more difficult than that. And these were words written by Jesus' brother. He wrote a book of the Bible named James. So if you have your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets, you can follow along there as we start in the first chapter of James, verse 2, and if not, you can follow along on the screens where we read these words. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now, we need to understand what he's talking about here. When he says, count it all joy, what he means is process it in your mind, process it in your mind as joy, meaning it's not going to be a natural feeling when you go through trials for you to feel joy. And if you're going right now in the midst of of trials and it feels like your world is caving in and it feels like nothing's going right and stress is just coming after you and, and it just is a constant strain within you, understand it's not a natural feeling for you to think, oh, I'm really glad all this is happening to me. And by the way, that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you spiritually. No, when he says count it all as joy, what he's talking about is he's talking about how we have to take that information and how we have to process it. It doesn't mean that the natural inclination that we have is going to be, this is fantastic. I love that I just got this diagnosis from my doctor. Or this is great. There's a round of layoffs going on at work, and I'm probably next. Or, wow, my relationship is crumbling. None of that is naturally going to feel good. And that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you spiritually. It doesn't mean that you're not enough like Jesus. It doesn't mean that there's a deficit within your life. What it means is that you're a human and you have feelings. So when he says to count it all as joy, what he's talking about is changing the thought process, not your initial feeling. You can't control your initial feelings. You can control how you think and how you process. And this is the first step that we, and we saw the same thing with what Jesus was talking about last week. It starts in the mind. And so when our world's are caving in around us, when we are going through hell on earth, when it seems like we can't catch a break, it doesn't mean that we throw a smile on our face and walk through life insincerely and just tell everybody, I'm great, things are awesome, when our world is burning down all around us. But what it does mean is we don't allow our thoughts to become captive to our circumstances. 
And we have to understand that we have to control that thought process. When you meet trials of various kinds, this is a certainty. This is a certainty. If you're alive, you will face trouble. You're going to be in one of three stages with trouble. You're either going to be in trouble, you're going to be just out of trouble, or you're going to get into trouble this week. It's just the way it goes. It's just the way it goes. You're either going to be in it right now, and you're going through it, or you're, you're going to have just gotten over the hump. You're going to have just gotten out of trouble to the place where you can finally breathe and you can finally introduce yourself to a new normal. Or maybe you've been there for a while. and You better pray right now that I'm not a prophet, but if you've been there a while, <laughs> come about Wednesday or Thursday this week, send me an email and let me know. Because it's coming. That's life. And when the trials come, it doesn't mean that you've done something wrong. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. Now, sometimes trials come into our life because we have done something wrong. And we've just done something really stupid and we've invited trouble onto ourselves. That, that happens. But that's not always the case. And sometimes the trials come because we do stupid things and we invite trouble upon ourselves. But sometimes the trials come and trouble comes into our life just because that's what happens in this world. And trouble comes. Trouble is going to find you. The question is, what do we do when it does? Count it all joy. Change your thought process. How can we do that? How can we look at these situations that none of us would like to sign up for, that none of us enjoy going through? How can we take these situations that all of us find ourselves in from time to time, more often than any of us would like, and how can we change the thought process from what we're initially feeling and turn that thought process into something where we can look at it and consider it joy. Well, he tells us how. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. These situations that we find ourselves in in life, the hardship that comes our way, whether we invited it upon ourselves or not, or whether the world just found us and decided to give it to us, no matter how we find ourselves there, understand that these situations that all of us find ourselves in are used by God to make you stronger. So this is the first step. This is how we can, we can change the thought process. This is how we can count something that none of us would sign up for and none of us would like. This is how we can change the thought process and to consider it as, as something that's beneficial for us when we understand that God never wastes an opportunity. And he uses all of the things that none of us would like to make us stronger. The problem with strength training is this, that unless you're injecting yourself with something really artificial, it's not instantaneous. You don't see results overnight. You don't walk into a gym one day benching 100 pounds and walk in the next day benching 200. Strength training takes time. And we understand that from a physical standpoint. But the same is true from a character standpoint. Rarely does the process of God change us 
instantaneously overnight. Now, I understand we're not talking a salvation issue right now. Because at the moment someone commits their life to Jesus, I get it. You're given the Holy Spirit, you get a new nature. But we're talking now about sanctification. And rarely, rarely if ever, is strength built overnight. It's not instantaneous. And the process of God playing out in our lives takes time. And that's why we need to make sure that we're gracious with people. That's why we need to make sure that we have a spirit of understanding. And that's why when we just shake our heads and we're like, yeah, imagine that. They made the same stupid mistake for the 16th time. Wonder how that's going to work out for them. We need to check ourselves. Because this process of becoming more like Jesus takes time. And maybe for some of you right now, you just need to give yourself a little bit more grace. Because you've built these expectations for yourself in your head of this is what's going to happen and this is what I'm going to look like by this date. And you just haven't given yourself the time that you need for God to dig in and fully develop your character and work on you. But here's the deal. God loves you enough that he's going to go to work on you. That's not always a fun process. And rarely is it a quick one. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This takes time. Work out plans that only last the first two weeks of January. Do nobody other than the gym owner any good. They get you with the year-long membership while you're cramming the Christmas cookies at every holiday party that you go to. And they're like, yeah, January 1st, New Year's resolution. This is going to be the year. And you don't see the gym after January 15th. Work out plans that last until January 15th. Don't do anyone any good except for the gym owner. Understand your life is a process. And you have to let the process play out. Let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This takes time. But the problem is that we're going through hardship. And we're experiencing things that we don't want to experience. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. God will grant you wisdom, but here's I'm just going to tell you, here's the problem. You ask God, God will give you wisdom, but the problem is this, pain is a great teacher. Pain's a great teacher. Just think about it. When have you learned the most in life? Most of us don't handle blessing well. That's just the truth. Most of us don't handle blessing well. When do the vast majority of us walk the closest with God? When we are in the midst of the trial and we are just met with something that we say, I can't make it, I can't do this on my own. And we cry out to God and God eventually delivers us seldom on the time frame that we would, that we would sign up for, but God eventually delivers us. And then what happens? We find ourselves in that time where we're walking through life and everything's going well. And where's our dependency in God in those times? Israel never did well with blessing. I mean, you just read the Old Testament and you're like, catastrophe, 
God saved them, they got stupid, catastrophe. God saved them, they got stupid, catastrophe. Uh, it just keeps repeating itself. And you look at it and you're like, you idiots. It's not that difficult. And then look at the cycle of your life and you're like, you idiot. It's okay, it's kind of difficult. Most of us don't handle blessing well. And if we find ourselves right now in a season where things are going well, make it a discipline. Because it's going to be more difficult for you. As weird as this is, it's going to be more difficult for you when things are going well for you to keep your intimacy with God than it is for you when your world is falling apart. And maybe, just maybe, the reason that sometimes our world has to fall apart so frequently It's because God loves us so passionately. He wants to do something within us. And that's the only time he can get our attention. We need to make it a discipline to do well with blessing. Because most of us don't. And God will grant you wisdom if you ask him for it. But understand, pain is a great teacher. And it lets us learn the lessons that we never forget. So when you ask God for wisdom, be very careful. And as somebody who cares about you and your pastor, I'm just going to say, before you ever pray and ask God for patience, really think, is this really what I want? Because you're going to find yourself around the most annoying people you will ever experience in your life. You are going to find yourself in the most frustrated situation. You're going to be like, God, no, just impute the patience. Just put it within me. And God's going to say, oh, no, 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 no. I am going to, I am going to give you every annoying person And I'm going to make you learn it the hard way. And I'm just telling you, I've made that mistake. I've prayed for patience. God's never let me forget it. Be careful. God will give you wisdom. But pain's a great teacher. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Ask in faith. Pray with expectation. When you you call out to God, pray with expectation that He is going to answer, that He hears you, that He will deliver you. Pray with expectation when you call out to God. Not doubting, not like a wave of the sea that's tossed back and forth. No, when you pray, pray with expectation that God hears you and God loves you and He has your best in mind and God wants to do something within you that brings you closer to Him with all that expectation. We can boldly pray and call on God to answer our prayers, but that needs to be our mindset, that we approach God with boldness and with a spirit of expectation. Otherwise, when we doubt, it's like we're riding a wave. Now, listen, riding waves are fun when you're near the shore. When you got the family vacation going on, and you're out there, and you've got the You've got the rafts, or if you're coordinated and you're out on the West Coast, you've got the surfboard, catching the waves of the Pacific. If you're a 43-year-old man with some of that fluorescent stuff on your nose and you wear a shirt so you don't get your shoulders fried, you're riding a boogie board in the Atlantic. I mean, it's just, just one of the things you have to understand about life. I mean... You know, you're not seeing the 43-year-old guy with zinc on his nose out catching waves on the surfboard in California. You need to go to the Atlantic and ride your boogie board. I mean, just the name of uh, just the name of the mechanism lets you know this is for people that wear zinc on their nose and wear t-shirts so they don't get their shoulders burned. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You do you and be proud of it, all right? There's no no shame in that. But that's like that's 
That's fun, slightly embarrassing. But that's, those are all fun things that you can do in, in the ocean that, that, with waves that are fun. That's fun. You know when waves aren't fun? When you're deep sea fishing and you didn't take Dramamine and it's 100 degrees and it feels like there's no wind and you're on a charter that's been oversold and half of the boat thinks it's optional to wear deodorant <laughs> and you drank every water that you packed on the journey. And then the boat starts to move and the waves start to beat up against it. Waves aren't fun when you're out at sea. So when you're near the shore and you've got control of everything, it can be a lot of fun to ride the waves. But the reality is in life, we're in the deep end. And we like to think sometimes we've got control and we can handle it, but the truth is we never are. We can't. And when you're out to sea and the waves start pounding the boat, being tossed back and forth, it's not a fun experience. And you find yourself in the hardship of this life with your world caving in and trouble everywhere you turn. The last thing you need is to be tossed back and forth. Because when doubt creeps into the equation and you don't take captive your thoughts and your mind, then every facet of your life is out of control. When the hard times come, it doesn't mean that God's mad at you. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. It's quite the opposite. It means that God is doing something within you. And even though you can't always see it, have the resolve with a certainty to say that God loves me and God is greater than my circumstance. And even though I don't see it and even though I don't feel it right now, I know that God is up to something that is bigger and greater than me and God wants to do something big within me. And when the enemy comes and he just whispers that it's This isn't going to be good for you. This doesn't end well. Can't you see how this is going to play out? There is no hope. You have no peace. You have nowhere to turn. When all of those things are being whispered to you, in your mind is where it starts. And how can you count it all joy when you face the hardship of this world by stepping back and remembering how great God is and his love for for you, and it's evidenced, by the way, in the fact that he loves you enough to be there with you in those hard times. And you might not see the solution, but God does. And if you're a follower of Jesus, What can happen anyway? When as we saw last week, Jesus tells us to change our perspective. And instead of looking at this world as the end all be all, we look at the one to come. And we see how much greater God is than our circumstances. God isn't your friend you call up and ask for advice only to disregard the advice that you're given. You have friends like that? They find themselves in a really hard time and then they call you up and they're like, hey, here's what's going on. What should I do? And you listen and you tell them the hard truth of what they should do. 
And there's part of you that knows they're not going to like this because th- this is going to be hard or there's going to be some pain involved. But this is honestly what they, what they need to do in order to find some solutions for what they're going through. And they listen. They're like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's really good. Okay. Hey, thanks so much. Thanks for talking. Really appreciate it. They hang up. You talk to them a week later. Hey, how's that going? Did, did you? No, I, I decided to do this instead. And it's the exact opposite of, of what you told them to do. You ever have... You ever have a friend like that, or maybe you have a kid like that, or, or maybe you have a spouse like that, I don't point, whatever, uh, but if you've, ever, if you've ever found yourself in that situation, the first time you're like, oh, okay, maybe it wasn't clear, and so the next time you make sure you're just like, no, super clear, okay, um, I, I've heard you, here's exactly what you need to do. And, and you just make sure that it is crystal clear. There's no question whatsoever. And, and you make it just so abundantly clear. You're like, this is, this is the path you need to go on. Here's the first step. Here's the second step. Here's the third. I mean, you really lay it out in detail. You go to your contacts. You select her number. You say, I never want to see you again. Bye. Send. And then you delete her number. Like, you make it that clear. And then you see them a week later. And you're like, hey, did, did you break things off? Uh, well, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're grabbing dinner later tonight. Like, there is no third time. Like, quit wasting my time. There's no third meeting. There, it's pointless. And otherwise, you're just going to get frustrated, and you're just going to continue to go in this cycle. And it's infuriating because you see so clearly exactly what needs to be done, but they just don't. Do it. And if you've ever had a friend like that or a kid like that or a spouse like that or whatever the case may be, you know how infuriating it is. But don't treat God that way. I think some of us could be in a mess right now. Not because wisdom evades us but simply because we don't want to do what's wise. I think some of us could be in a mess right now, not because wisdom evades us, but simply because we don't want to do what's wise, because it feels better, we think, just to keep doing what we want to do, even though we know that Scripture paints a very different picture for us. And for you, I would just say stop riding the wave. Stop riding the wave. You've trusted God with your soul, now trust Him with your life. God isn't the friend you call up and then disregard. Very often, He's given us a very clear path. And we just have to be willing to walk it even when it's not easy or popular or, quite frankly, the times we don't like it. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. When you don't bother to listen and receive the wisdom of God, God quite simply removes himself from your equation. When you choose to walk a path contrary to the standards that God has set forth, and then you say, God, please bless me in this endeavor, God's not going to bless you in that endeavor. When you don't bother to listen and receive the wisdom of God, God isn't going to bless your endeavor. He isn't going to bless you ignoring His plan. God isn't going to grant you stability when you're unstable. God wants you to walk in wisdom. He wants you to follow his mandates. He wants you to go his way. And sometimes that can be something we don't want to do, but it is always best. How can we count it joy? How can we consider it joy when our world is falling apart? When we remember That God is doing something to make us stronger. 
I'm coaching six to eight-year-old boys right now in Little League Baseball. And for some of them, it's the next step up from T-ball, and this is the first year that they're playing. And it's called coach pitch. Now, when, when I was growing up, coach pitch, you had a dad out on the mound tossing a couple balls, hopefully over the plate. Sometimes you never knew where they were going to end up, but hopefully they were, they're going to be around the plate. Well, those days are gone. And now we have these pitching machines that, in theory, are a lot more accurate than old dads out on the mound. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they're not. It's just the way it goes. For the vast majority of my team, I could go out there and I could loft a ball up so that every single time those boys came up to bat, they could hit the ball and not strike out. And when they strike out, it's not always pretty. There were temper tantrums at the last practice. There were tears and a helmet went flying. There was a bat thrown. There was like there was weeping and gnashing of teeth over a strikeout in practice. And I could go out there and I could loft a ball every single time. The vast majority of my team could get a hit. There's a couple boys, thoughts and prayers for them. But other than them, every single player on that team could get a hit every time up. But it wouldn't make them stronger. And it wouldn't help them get better. And sometimes, hardship. Sometimes difficulty. Sometimes a layoff. Sometimes a diagnosis. Comes. And none of us would look at it and say, this is awesome. In our minds, we have to hold it captive and understand that we have a Father who loves us and will never let an opportunity go to waste. And even when we can't feel Him and even when He seems distant, He's working to make us strong. And when we remember that, we can count those hardships. We can count our trials as joy. God help us. Just help us. The people who are here right now in the midst of it, Give them strength. Let them walk in the stability of your precepts. Let them follow your plan. For the person who's here, and God, they're out of the trial. I pray they'd handle blessing well. I pray that their dependency on you would, would, what's so often not the case, would just grow in the good times. And for those that the trials are going to creep up this week, help them remember that you are greater. So God, Help us call on you with expectation. Help us follow your way. Let us be wise. And help us remember with a proper perspective 
when everything's crashing down around us. But you are greater. And you are good. In your son Jesus' name we pray.